Hello everyone, how are you? I uh, hope you guys, you are okay. Um, it is my assumption that all of us have gone actually through a week one lecture, which was um, the definition of terms for the study. So that will make the study easy as we proceed throughout the lecture, as long as we know the terms and as long as we are able to define uh, what is sustainable tourism is and we know the relationship between sustainable tourism and cultural heritage management it will be easy for us um, to sail through the course okay so um we are going to look at uh, week two which is uh, the case study victoria falls world heritage site bearing in mind that um victoria falls world heritage site it actually falls under the seven wonders of the world. So firstly, um, we're going to look at uh, the brief history of Victoria Falls, okay? For a millennia, the falls existed and discovered by anyone outside Africa. However, the first European to see the famous falls was David Livingstone, who loyally named them after his Queen Victoria. So um, this site had remained known to only the local people. And the first person from the overseas or anybody from Europe to discover this site, this, uh, this falls was actually David Livingstone who was a stone explorer uh, from the Zambian side. So he named the site Victoria Falls after his Queen Victoria. So um, it means that before the name, before the site was named by uh, David Livingstone as Victoria Falls, the, the site had um, a traditional name or a local name by the local communities. The locals used the name Mosi Owatunya, Mosi Owatunya, which means the smoke that thunders, referring to the crashing noise of the falls and the towering mist that rises above it. So this was um, the traditional name that was given to the site by the local communities, Mosi Owatunya, which means the smoke that thunders. So they actually um, created a name based on what is or what was happening at the site as the water falls down, produces uh, some sort of a smoke that thunders. When it crashes, it produces a certain noise. So that's when they came up with the name um, Mose Owatunya, the smoke that thunders. So that was actually um, the traditional name of the site. And then when David Livingstone discovered the site, in shown by the local communities, he named the site Victoria Falls. Okay. So through archaeological and historical researches, there has been signs of human inhabitation, inhabitation around the site dating back three million years ago during the Stone Age. So this was the research that shows the inhabitation um, around the site by the Stone Age uh, communities with this back to three million years. The Khoisan in the area were displaced by the Batoka tribe who currently occupy the area today and later joined by the Matebele, Makololo, and the Lozu. The Makololo introduced the site to Livingstone, who shared the news to the whole world. So um, these um, Stone Age societies, the Khoisan, were, the, were maybe described as the first descendants of that area. So they were later joined by the Batoka tribe 
who occupy the area and the, the still descendants of the Batoga tribe right now, who were later joined uh, by the Matebele, who came with them uh, from South Africa, Zululand. And they were later um, infused with the Makololo and the Lozi, the Lozi um, were the people that were around um, what we called Southern Rhodesia, which is currently Zimbabwe, the Northern, which is actually the, on the, they were actually found on the um, Southeastern parts of the Southern Rhodesia, which is currently named Zimbabwe. So they came to stay around the area, which um, brought about different uh, tribes and uh, quite a number of, of, of cultures circling around the area. So the Makololo were the first people who introduced um, Livingstone to the site. Livingstone reached the site by the dugout canoe under the escort of Chief Sekeletu. So you will discover that um, the local leadership, I may say the traditional leaders, are actually the main people who control the cultural resources for the communities. I may say they are actually, since from then it has been a tradition, it's actually a tradition um, by these communities that are the traditional leaders are the one who makes sure who comes to the area, who views their heritage. So it's actually stands right now. That's why you see um, in some circumstances when the government uh, decides to make some changes into the local communities uh, property or cultural heritage property. It becomes a, a, a challenge if they do not like liaise um, with the traditional leaders. So they actually play a very, 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 very important role in the community and in the management of cultural heritage. So that's when we see here Livingston being introduced by uh, Chief Sekeletu, who was actually leading the community, who was actually the chief of the community around the place. After Livingstone had told the world about the place, massive visits to the Victoria Falls were experienced. Uh, that's when we saw uh, a number, quite a number, or I may say an influx of, of tourists across the world coming to see the site and experience um, what has been transpiring on the site or what is currently transpiring as well in the site. So in 1905, the construction of the Victoria uh, Falls Bridge was completed, which greatly opened up to tourism to the area commissioned by Cecil John Rhodes as part of his Cape to Cairo vision. So uh, we, have, we had um, Cecil John Rhodes from the British South Africa Company, who has, come, who has uh, constructed the Victoria, the Victoria Falls Bridge on the Zambezi River. And um, the main intention by Cecil John Rhodes to create this bridge or to construct this bridge was, had nothing in fact to do with uh, the Victoria Falls. It actually had only an intention of creating his routes for trade. So the bridge was actually meant for his vehicles, uh, for his transportation to jump across the river, Zambezi, to Zambia and to Zimbabwe. So we'll discover that this kept to Cairo vision of Cecil John Rhodes, uh, as we may go back to history, you'll see that um, Zimbabwe is a land of the country. I may say Southern Rhodesia was, because it was regarded as Southern Rhodesia by that time, it was meant to be the center of the road networks 
uh, for Cecil John Roth's trade. So that's when we see the construction of the bridge, which actually helped um, in the booming of the tourism industry around um, the Victoria Falls area. So this, um, this place is actually uh, positioned along the Zambezi Valley. That's where, uh, the, that's where the site Victoria Falls is. The half of the part, half of half part of the site is can be viewed from the Zambian side, and the half part of the site uh, can be viewed from um, the Zimbabwean side. The river plunges head headlock headlock into a hundred meter vertical chasm, spanning the full one end and a half kilometer width of the river, creating the biggest kitchen of the falling water in the world and also one of the seven natural wonders of the world. So um, that's a, a brief description of what the falls are. Now let's go to the real facts on Victoria Falls. So the original names or the, um, I may say the, the local name of the place was Mose Owatunya, which is a, a Lozi language or Shungu Namutitima, which is a Tonga, Sewonga, and the Chongwe. Its, uh, its location is on Southern Africa between uh, Zambezi and, sorry, between Zimbabwe and Zambia. And we discovered that uh, before these countries uh, found independence, Zim uh, Zambia was named uh, the Northern Rhodesia and Zimbabwe was named the Southern Rhodesia. So the water course is on Zambezi River. Then geographical coordinates, though that the geographical coordinates as you can see them here. Okay, and then the map reference is Africa. The type of, um, the type is a cataract waterfall. The actual length is 1.708 meters, which is um, 5.604 feet. The Zimbabwean site is uh, 675 meters, which is 40%. And on the Zambian side, it's 1.033 meters, which is 60%. It's actually 1,033, sorry, 1,033 meters, which is 60% um, of the fuel. Then the view, uh, the view, um, the view at length is hundred times hundred percent. Zimbabwean side is seventy five percent. On the Zambian side is twenty five percent. The height is seventy meters, and the elevation is eight hundred and um, eighty five meters above the sea level. Underlying rock is the basalt, and the average flow rate is one thousand and eighty eight cubic meters per annual. Then the highest ever recorded is that on 12,800. Then the lowest uh, ever recorded has been 3,000 cubic meter squares. Okay, let's proceed again. So there, um, I've, I've actually quoted some, some pictures there to show the view. So you'll discover that this is an aerial photograph, especially this one on the right, it has been taken on aerial photography, even the same in the fifth, the first one as well, it's, take, it's showing almost the entire falls. So um, those are the falls. So again to the air. So this is um the bridge that was constructed by um Cecil John Rose for his Cape to Cairo mission. So this is the same bridge that's where um, the bungee jumping is happening. Um, I hope you guys, soon after this study, one of you will, will actually decide to come and visit this place. It's actually a, a best place to be. So uh, I hope one of the days we'll see someone at Victoria Falls doing the bungee jumping which is one of the most fearful things that I'll never do in my life. 
thank you so um that's it so uh, the next one here that's the man himself um david livingstone who was the stone stone explorer from the northern uh, rhodesia which is a uh, zambia inside he was the first person or uh, the first guy to discover the Victoria Falls under the escort of uh, Chief Sekeletu. So that is the guy. Thank you. So you proceed further. Now let's go to the govern the governance of Victoria Falls because we discover that um governance actually plays a very 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 important role in the cultural heritage management because it has to include all the involved stakeholders. If some stakeholders are not taken into consideration, it will be very, 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 very difficult um, for the site to be preserved and to conserve. So um, we look at this, the governance of the site is under a number of organizations operating at different fields and adhere, all, they all adhere to UNESCO. Remember, we have mentioned in the beginning that um, Victoria Falls it falls under um, World Heritage Site. So UNESCO is making sure that all the conservation practices are done properly since it's a World Heritage Site. So the first one is the UNESCO, which is the United Nations Education Scientific, Educational, Scientific and Cultural Organizations. They are contributing to the building of a, of a culture of peace, the eradication of poverty, sustainable development, and intercultural dialogue through education, the sciences, culture, communication, and information. So that's the role that is played um, by the, by the uh, UNESCO. So uh, I've, 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 I've learned too much. Let me check out, I, I've been skipping some slides. Okay, so secondly, uh, we're having, um, we're having uh, the um, Parks and Wildlife Act from the Zimbabwean side, which is uh, the chapter 20 of section 14. The major objectives uh, of this act is to pro is the protection of wildlife, ecological um, processes and landscapes within the parks estate. This PWMA, is a quasi government organization that is empowered by the act to carry out ecological management and the research law enforcement provision of tourist of uh, tourist accommodation and revenue collection within the Victoria Falls and Zimbabwe National Parks. So this is um, the Parks and Wildlife Act. You will discover that um, around the site there, we have, um, the, 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 we have the one the Huange National Park, which is which is a uh, closer to the Victoria Falls, and even around Victoria Falls there, uh, we have the the, the, the the Victoria Falls National Park. So this organization is the one that protects uh, such, such areas, and it makes sure that the issues to do with um, poaching and so forth are also dealt with. So that plays a very, very, very vital role and make sure that um, the wildlife around is protected and, and the people staying around are even protected against the wildlife. You know, uh, I remember there, is a certain, there, is a, there was a certain period of time uh, when I was doing primary school, when I was still at primary school, um, there were news that uh, there had been about two lions which had escaped um, it jumped the fence instead. So I remember it was scary to go to the Victoria Falls by then, but they were actually 
manage to to get the animals back into the into the um, into the park. So that's actually the role that is being played by the Parks and Wildlife Act. Okay, let's proceed. We have the Environmental Management Act. The act the act's objectives is to provide for sustainable management of natural resources and environment prevention of pollution and environment degradation and preparation of the national environment plan and other plans for the management and protection of the environment so these um protect the environment they make sure that the environment is protected in terms of pollution environmental degradation so that's when we see that, 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 that that's why we see um around Victoria Falls, they have created um, what we call um, what we call pathways, whereby they try to make sure that um, the area is not, um, the environment is not degraded. So see, they make sure that the pollution is very, 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 very monitored there. We have seen them um, installing uh, a lot of dustbins around so that people can throw garbage inside, especially plastic, which is very, very dangerous um, to the environment and the and the uh, and, and the uh, and the animals live and animals living around. So that's the main objective of the Environment Management Act, which is chapter 20 of um, section 27. Now we have Another one, which is the, um, the National Museums and Monuments Act, Chapter 2511. This act requires the National Museums and National Monuments to establish and maintain records of all sites and monuments within the country. So that's for the record purposes of all the monuments in this uh, monuments museums uh, in, the, in, in the country. So that is the role that the NMZ plays. We have the Tourism Act, chapter 20 of, uh, chapter 14 of 20. The act sets standards to facilitate implementation of tourist related activities and developments. The act regulates designation registration and creating of tourist facilities and registration of personal of person of uh, persons providing services connected with tourism the zimbabwe tourism authority is um, the implementing agency it has uh, sorry it's the implementing agency so um that's the um, the act that actually facilitates uh, tourism in the country. So everyone that um, wants to do any facility for tourism has to go through this um, through this act. They make sure that it's safe for the tourists and even safe for the environment. They make sure that um, all the preservation and conservation standards at the site are highly maintained in the same sense, um, meeting the needs of the tourists and not jeopardizing the future, um, the future generations interest on the site as well. So that's actually the role that is being played by the tourism, by the tourism act. We have the Forestry Act chapter. The Forestry Act provides for the designation of forestry areas and the protection of forests, trees, and the natural uh, produce. The Act regulates that regulates trade in forest produce and afforestation of private land. The Forest Commission is required to work with schools and rural district council to establish forestration projects. So that's um, 
the role played, played by the Forest Act, chapter 19 of 5. They make sure that they protect all the, all the flora side of the area for all the issues to do with um, afforestation. They control such areas, they control such, um, such uh, activities. They make sure that the flora is protected uh, even against even against um, people, we we understand that sometimes we may we face we face um, people that deal a lot with the deforestation and the issues to do with them um, wealth. Well, sorry, um, I mean um, what you call this um, the veld fires. So they make sure that all such things are controlled in terms of the act. Then we have the Regional Town and Country Planning Act of chapter 29, 12. The act mandates the Victoria Falls municipality to manage land and provide services within its area of jurisdiction. The management of land involves the subdivision of land to create land for housing, the commercial, commercial and tourist related development as well as sustainability of the development related acts parliament dealing with the environment pollution and control of development so the act is actually um shortly i may say it is actually um responsible for the development in terms of um, the buildings, town planning. If let's say if a certain area has been um, allocated for, 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 for development in terms of our houses, they actually make sure that that actually the buildings, the building of, or they may say the development does not actually affect um, the authenticity of the site. And they make sure that they control overpopulation because overpopulation actually pose some threats in terms of, uh, in terms of, um, what you call, in terms of um, the, preservation and conservation of cultural heritage. So they actually make sure that that kind of development does not um, impact, does not negatively impact um, the, the, the authenticity of the site because preservation of, of cultural heritage property it advocates for the authenticity of the site to be maintained. So they make sure that even, let's say maybe the, in, in terms of, um, Developments. Let's say um, there is quite a number of um, of, of, of uh, lodges, hotels, etc. That needs to be uh, built on the area to facilitate uh, tourism. They make sure that um, such development does not impact negatively on the area, as well as uh, the areas, um, the, 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 the areas and original uh, look. So the, that's the role that is played by the regional town and country planning act of 2912. We have the rural district um, councils act chapter 2913. The act provides for the declaration of districts and establishment of rural districts council which full which fall under the Ministry of Local Governance. Furthermore, the Act confers, um, co confers and imposes functions upon rural district councils and provides for administration of their areas. The Victoria Falls World Heritage Site falls in the Wange District. This district council administers Wange's campfire program, which facilitates of the, the which facilitates flow of 
benefits from the district's natural resources to the community's benefits. Benefits are um, driven from um, safari hunting, rafting, and photographic safaris. So the Rural District Council Act is actually the one that um, the local communities, or I may say the, the local custodians, um, communicate with other organizations through. If ever the, the communities have got, a, have got a challenge, or if ever the communities have got some grievances in terms of um, the benefits coming from, the, from, from tourism or coming from any other sector, they actually um, liaise with the rural district which then uh, presents their, 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 their um, complaints to other, um, to other governmental programs. So it's very, very important because if it happens that the conservation measures, or I may say the conservation procedures do not uh, include the rural district councils, it means that the um, the local communities have been uh, left out. So any conservation measure or any conservation implementation that might be done, they make sure that the Rural District Council is also in line with them because we see in some, in some circumstances, uh, for example, I'll give an example. There is a, there is a certain site um, in Marshallland, which was a very, 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 very impressive rock art, rock art site. So um, in that area, when the government decided to protect the area from, to protect the site from the local communities, um, they did not communicate properly with the local communities through, through the Rural District Council Act. So they just decided to fence the area. And when the communities, the local communities um, discovered that the place had been fenced without any, without their consent, they ended up splashing the paint on the side, on, on the art, as well as um, obliterating the entire art and as we speak today the site is no more just because of the lack of inclusion of the lack of including the local communities um in conservation in, in conservation um activities so it is very important that any organization or any government organization that intends to protect the sites has to liaise with the local communities so that they understand what they intend to do on their side. Then we have the Zimbabwe National Water Authority. It governs the optimum development and utilization of water resources in Zimbabwe. Water quality management and abstraction with the objective of preventing water pollution. Water pollution are the focal point of the act. So this is a, this one is simple. It actually looks at the use of water and resources in Zimbabwe. It protects water resources for example, uh, the Victoria, if you, if you look at this, uh, the, the, the Zambezi, Zambezi Valley, the Zambezi River, sorry, is actually the one that supplies the water around the Victoria Falls town. And it actually, it's actually responsible for generation of, um, of, 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 of electricity. So this, uh, this act, make sure that pollution is at minimal levels. Then we have the Traditional Leaders Act, Chapter 29, 17. The act 
1989, so 1998, provides for the chiefs to promote and uphold cultural values among the members of the community. It's also it also recognizes them as legal custodians of traditional inst institutions as well as both tangible and intangible cultural heritage in their respective areas. The chiefs, the chief among his other duties has the responsibility to prevent any unauthorized settlement or use of any land. The chief also have to have power to protect archaeological heritage that is threatened by development within the areas. So um, this is a very, very, very vital role again that is played by the by the leaders of uh, of the communities, the leader act, the, the traditional leader act. As we know that um within uh, Africa, within uh, Af African communities, traditional leaders uh, play an influential role in terms of in terms of organizing the, the community. So this act, we have uh, the we have the chiefs that controls. I may say the chiefs that are actually in control of the community. So this act recognizes uh, them as legal custodian of traditional institutions as well as both tangible and intangible cultural heritage in their respective areas. As we know that um, cultural heritage sites are amongst the communities, so the chiefs are the one given the role to protect to protect um to protect the, the this site so any development around the areas has to be approved by the chiefs so the chiefs they are the ones that actually communicate with the public they are the ones that communicate <coughs> with um, the local communities then take um the, 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 the local communities um suggestions to the rural district council which then lies with the upper with uh with, with, with the upper government government um government acts or i may say the government um bodies so under the chiefs we have um the village heads they are also the ones that are looking after the communities they control the communities they control um development within uh with, 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 within cultural heritage sites and they are actually the ones that actually maintain the that will maintain the the areas in terms of you know some of these areas they're actually um maintained or they means they're actually money conserved or preserved through the myths and the taboos for example, we have um, one of the rain-making shrine in Zimbabwe, in Matopos. And this area is actually controlled by the local communities. But uh, due to miscommunication on that side, it's no longer having its value like it used to have because of that fact that uh, we had seen visitors, or I may say we had seen tourists um, from different areas, especially locally from the country, coming into the site without um, respecting the taboos of the area. So it's no longer happening like it used to happen before, because um, I remember when I was still young as a boy, when we had, when the when the village when the village had the problems of um of rain, they will um do a ceremony. They will go there unto that uh, unto, uh, unto that site unto that shrine, and immediately when they come back, uh, the rains will fall. But nowadays, it never happens the way they used to do. So, it's because of these taboos that have been um that have been not adhered to and people had been breaking uh, been breaking 
uh, the rules around the site, which has actually led to the deterioration of the site and the site has actually lost its value. So we see that it is very, very important that um, visitors adhere uh, to the to the to the laws, the means, or I may say the taboos that preserve the sites, so that these sites can be kept for the coming generations. Now let's go to conservation and sustainable tourism. On the 1st of February, 2008, the state parties of Zambia and Zimbabwe submitted a joint progress report on implementing uh, the recommendations of the World Heritage Committee. So as I have said earlier on that, this site is actually shared between Zimbabwe and Zambia. You can view the site from the Zimbabwean side. You can view the site from uh, the Zambian side. So on the on February two thousand and eight, these two party states um they sat down together and then made an implementation on on the recommendations of the World Heritage Committee. So the institutional framework and legal cooperation programs has been largely implemented it's been largely implemented with the remaining harmonization of laws between the two party states planned for completion for com completion in 2008 so um i may say briefly these two countries they came together to, join, to make uh, what you call a joint management plan, which they agreed upon certain things. We had uh, officials from the, Zambia, the Zimbabwean side, we had officials from the Zambian side sitting together um, saying, okay, now how are we going to manage the site? Because it's actually one side. It doesn't matter the other side is Zambia, the other side is Zimbabwe. So they sat down and agreed on certain terms of um, how to manage, to manage uh, the site. That's when we'll discover that even today, if you view the site from the from the Zimbabwean side and the site from the Zimbabwean side, still uh, the, 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 the the conservation and the conservation measures that are being taken are the one and the same thing because it's one site. They're actually they're actually um fostered by um one one committee one committee or I may say one party, which um is the one that was formed in 2008. The state parties have yet to ensure land use compatibility within the property. Therefore, potential inappropriate tourism and other developments posed a threat. So this is what the, um, they discovered upon, upon sitting as two party states. This is what they discovered. They discovered that um, the potential inappropriate tourism and other development pose great threat to the site. So this is how. This is why uh, we are now going to discuss the issue of um, poorly sustained uh, tourism on this site. The parties also led to the establishment of a joint ministerial committee. Okay, let me see if someone got lost. The parties led, yes, the, uh, the parties also led to the um, establishment of the joint ministerial uh, committee. Implementation of the joint of, of, of this joint integrated management plan for the World Heritage Property and securing funding for its implementation. Moratorium of the construction and development of all 
tourist infrastructure, facilities, or services within the World Heritage property. So this was um, this is what they established. They built uh, the, 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 the improvement of the of the tourism infrastructure, facilities, and services within the World Heritage property. So that's when we see um, that, that that's why we see um, there are lodges, there are hotels, there are um, the, 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 the are bars. We have quite a, a number of um, tourism facilities and infrastructure in both areas, the Zambi in the Zimbabwean side and the Zambian side. Development of the draft, sorry, of this draft desired states of conservation, which can be assessed during uh, the monitoring of the property states, of the property state of the conservation and beta addresses management and protection concerns. So these are the threats um, that they discovered, the threats uh, to the property, urban development, eradication on, of invasive, which resulted to uh, eradication of invasive species, control of pollution and um, extraction of water from the Zambezi, from the Zambezi Valley. So if now we look at the, 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 the water, the water, the, 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 the water, Zimbabwean Water Authority Act, now it comes into place here. The state parties identified the following management challenges as emerging threats facing the property. The first threat was the threats to fish population integrity from the fish disease episodic ulcerative syndrome. So this was the first thing that they, this was the first threat that they discovered, the threat to, to fish population. Second one, inadequate capacity for research and monitoring. So this was the one that this one is simple and straightforward. C, expanding human population in Livingstone and Victoria Falls town as it impacts directly on the ecosystem. Furthermore, Livingstone and Victoria Falls infrastructure cannot adequately cope with a high population density increasing the scope of population within the environment of the property, environs of the property. So um, this is the other challenge that they discovered. There's actually growing population around, as we know that um, most African countries are having a, an economic challenge. So uh, we see uh, actually a migration of people from uh, marginal, different marginal areas coming um, to settle around these uh, around these towns, the Livingstone, uh, the Livingstone town, and the Victoria Falls town. So maybe I, I should I should have uh, elaborated here firstly. So um, we'll discover that um, the the town. That is a that is next to the site on the Zambian side. It was named after David Livingstone. So the area is now called uh, Livingstone Town, and this other site is called the Victoria Falls Town. So when these two parties um sit down together to discuss on, on the management of the on the on the on the management of the site, Victoria Falls World Heritage Site, they discover that there's actually an increase in number of um the people coming around so which means that which means that uh, the resources or the environment couldn't cope with um, this increasing numbers of the population the population population density remember the more the population the more degradation of the of, of the land becomes so even the resources become insufficient for the people so this actually result um to a, 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 a lot of undesirable uh, factors taking place on the site that's why we see there is a challenge of, um, of poaching. That's why we see there is a, a challenge of, um, of theft, quite a number of challenges that um, are brought by the population that is increasing on this side. So these parties have sat down to, to discuss on how to deal with such problems in these towns, which is actually falling under poorly managed, um, I may say poorly uh, controlled 
tourism. So this is um, the fact on the increased number of uh, people coming into there because more the more the people they go there, the infrastructure, it means a lot of building. And you discover that some of these um, some of these areas around Victoria Falls, they are no, they are ne they are never meant for um, they are never safe. I may say they are never safe for human for human habitation due to certain circumstances. For example, some of these areas are actually um, as I, as I mentioned earlier that we have a, a, a park there. It's not safe for people to stay to 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 to, to habitat around the park because anything can happen they can be devoured um by the wild animals from the park as well as um it is a uh, very 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 dangerous for people to just build um just build their 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 their, 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 their homes and ha their houses in a, 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 around the area because it actually um changes um the original the original the originality of the site so it actually alters um the the the, the 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 site and the values of the site are are getting lost if we just have people um seeking haphazardly on the site so this is what uh, the, the, the 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 this joint management committee uh, is facing right now so now we have a C. The point E is the control of Lantana Camara. One of the steep slopes remains a problem as the area are difficult to access. That's more. So all in all, I may say that is um, the brief history of the site. As you will continue to read around, uh, you will discover quite a number of things uh, pertaining to the history of the site, pertaining um, this uh, Victoria Falls site. So you discover that um, in this site, there's quite a number of things uh, that are happening. There are traditional, there are traditional um, activity, the traditional um, performances that are happening there. You will find uh, the drama groups that are performing. You will find um, quite a number of, of people doing poet there. You will find um, quite a number of of curious shops. Um, people selling their crafted goods. So um, that's what is really happening. And the population there is actually growing a lot. And we have, we have a challenge as the economy is not good there in Zimbabwe. So as we, as we have quite a number of, of, uh, of people coming to the site, I may say is we have a number of um, tourists visiting the site, it becomes a challenge for the heritage managers to manage the site. So that's when we see a need uh, for sustainable tourism, because if we continue like that, it means that um, the heritage is under threat, the heritage site is under threat and possibly the, the, future, the future generations will never uh, get an opportunity to, 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 to find the site as it is. So that's when we need, that's when the country needs, or that's when the heritage managers are around, that's when the, the responsible, um, the responsible, uh, it's the responsible government has to take a step to try to mitigate, um, <clears throat> to mitigate um, uh, the, the measures there to save at the site from us uh, from, from unsustained from poorly sustained uh, tourism so um i think this brings us to the end of um this brings us to the end of uh, our um, uh, our week two lecture i think i have explained and made clear some of the points so if ever you have any other questions, please feel free um, to ask the questions. So all in all, that is uh, our Victoria Falls that is going, that we're going to use as the case study for this uh, topic. For, I, may say, I may say for this study 
of um, sustainable tourism and cultural heritage management. So this is the Victoria Falls that I've discussed. Um, all in all, I think I have covered most of the areas in terms of the governance, in terms, um, in terms of the brief history of the site. So that's all. Thank you so much. Meet again on the coming week. Thank you.